Hi, I'm Gary Maloney. I'd like to briefly share with you some photographic experiences that began in 2002 when professional photographers were moving to digital and medium format film cameras were beginning to appear in the second hand market at affordable prices. I bought myself a Bronica GS1. It's officially a 6x7 camera but the actual aspect ratio is closer to 5.5 by 7, which I really like because it blows up neatly to fit a traditional 10 by 8 inch print. Of course, the advantage of this type of camera is that you can have films of different ISO in separate backs and you can change them mid-roll. Just have a, a dark slide and it goes into a nice little slot here. Press the button and voila, you can change it over and um, <laughs> it's a little bit tricky to put it back together. It's got a couple of little hooks here. They've got to go into a tiny slots here. You press it down, up and there we go. <clears throat> ah, and it's a good idea not to forget to take the slide out. Over the years, I've experimented from time to time with black and white photography, but I've seldom been completely happy with the results from 35mm. In reasonably well-lit indoor situations and shooting 400 ISO, I could get the tonal range, but not the subtleties, and it was fairly grainy. So I was keen to see what sort of a job one could do with a bigger negative. This one I shot for a CD cover has a similar amount of grain, but was taken in poorer lighting and with 3200 ISO, so I can't really complain. Still with the 3200 ISO, but in a workshop with a bit more light, I was getting a more lifelike clarity and no noticeable grain. But it was when I got out into the daylight and shot ISO 100 that the awesome smooth clarity of medium format was most evident. Shortly after I got the Bronica, I met some folks from Ipswich who had their own planes hanging at Boona and were willing to demonstrate their skills in formation flying. I saw a great opportunity to try my hand at aerial photography and I found it quite challenging. It was easy enough to come up with 125th of a second shutter speed as the optimum for capturing a good sweep of the propeller. These planes cruise on about 2400 revs you just divide that figure by 60 to get seconds and then divide by your shutter speed one two five and you get 0 0.32 which is a third of a revolution and that will look good if it's too bumpy you can get away with the 250th of a second but problems arise from the fact that you've got to poke your head out the window for a start you can't wear the headset the blast of air on the microphone just jams the intercom. So you have to communicate as best you can without it. Now, if you imagine, I'm sitting in the plane like this. And um, I've got my camera. I've got to loosen my safety belt a bit so I can screw around. I venture out and it just about smacks me against the side of the plane. In fact, the slipstream is so savage distorts your face and half shuts your eye and it's as much as you can manage to just frame up your shot let alone focus. So I found it best to focus on the ground before takeoff. You walk back from one of the planes until it fits nicely in frame and you focus it and you get some tape and stick it down so it doesn't move. Then I found that the shutter speed dial would get blown off setting, so I had to watch that. And the um, waist level finder was no good because it just collapsed. So I had to use the prism finder. That meant instead of shooting down here like this, I had to shoot from up here. So I had to indicate to the other plane to fly a bit lower so that I could point the camera down and not get a, a wing in the top of shot. I quickly realised that the best time of day for the best light and to avoid dark shadows under the wings was early morning. 
I liked it so much I didn't want to go at any other time. But it was a big ask. The pilots had to get out of bed at about 3.30am in order to get to the airfield and prep their planes in time. Then there was the problem of kangaroos still not finished their night shift on the runway. We had to chase them off and then hope they didn't hop back on during takeoff run. But what finally killed our activities was the concern that the townspeople would start complaining about being woken at such an hour. This shot is from our last flight, just when I was really starting to get the hang of it. I was really pushing the limits with this one. For all the aerial work, I used Fuji Valvia. For two reasons, you could get it in 50 ISO, which was good for slow shutter speeds, although for the last couple of flights I used 100 ISO. Secondly, it would print directly to Cibachrome paper, which was by far the best paper you could get. It had an almost 3D look about it, and as a bonus it was archival. Unfortunately, you can't get it now. It was discontinued in 2011, another casualty of the digital revolution. After that, I turned my attention to photo club workshops that hired beautiful models, including artists' models. This was shot with Fuji Riala 100, and I've had to cut the saturation back a bit. I love the fact that with the Bronica's standard 100mm lens, you could easily throw the background out of focus. But I found focusing accurately difficult. These lenses have maximum apertures of f3.5, f4, f4.5. So the viewfinder image, particularly through the prism, is not as bright as what I was used to with 35mm cameras with uh, apertures of f1.2. The waist level finder has got a little um, magnifier that flicks up and you can use that for fine tuning your focus. But it's a slow process. Oh, and you've got to compose your shot with a back to front image. This is not a camera suited to quick candid photography. But if you get it right, the clarity is awesome. For these and all subsequent color work, I used Portra NC160 and 400. NC meaning natural color. It was one of the three variants you used to be able to get. It gave beautifully accurate renditions of skin, not only of skin tones, but also things like unpainted wood. For the black and white, I used Ilford Delta 400. Getting accurate exposures took a bit of effort. This camera comes with uh, an auto exposure capability in the prism but I hardly ever used it. When you can't check your images immediately, it's too risky to rely on auto, uh, automatic. That's my experience anyway. I used a handheld meter in um, incident light mode, but when I thrust it in the faces of the young models, they'd reel back and say, what's that? I found myself to be a bit of an anachronism amongst a throng of club members all firing away with digital cameras. By the time I'd set up a pose, taken exposure readings and walked back and focused, a horde of photographers would be crowding in, taking a hundred shots and asking the model to move on. I'd be lucky to get my shot. I figured I had two options. The first was to hire my own model, which I did. This worked very well. I was able to choose my locations and work in a relaxed manner and I got some very pleasing shots. This one I converted from colour to black and white, which I think suited the mood better. But with the cost of film and processing already being quite expensive, paying the full cost of model hire as well made it an expensive exercise. The second option was to admit defeat and buy a digital camera, which I eventually did. But as you can see, I've kept the Bronica and I keep promising myself that one day I'll get back to it. I'm sure I will.